let's go ahead and get into chapter 15 now. Let me share my screen. Actually, give me one second. I want to pull up the book chapters too. But uh, yeah, so for these, we're going into uh, it's like exercise technique chapters. Um, actually, while you're here, to um, with the, the, I I find and I'm sure you did too. The the, the the exercise videos those are pretty straightforward, right? Oh yeah, they were like the ones we reviewed. Like they did the freaking hand power clean, like yeah. the deadlift, like yeah. You you were right. Just use their word. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> I remember. Yeah, I remember. I was just like, instead of using like the cues and stuff that I learned. Yep, yeah. exactly. That that that's the big that's the biggest part, and that's why I want to uh, I'm gonna pull up the text real quick too. But yeah, with, when it, when it comes to um those chap when it comes to those uh chapters, the uh the, the, or the questions on exercise technique, just look at how they explain stuff. You know, at at the end of each chapter. I'm gonna pull it up right now. But yeah, so for example, there's power snatch. I would definitely any. I would oh, look through yeah, all the actual, was on there. Yeah, all the <laughs> look through the look through the book. Not only because again, I know I knew how to do a power snatch before taking the exam, but you want to make sure you know their wording. So make sure you know what their starting uh, starting position is. Like you don't want to miss a question just because you forget like where they want your foot placement. So feet placement between hip and shoulder width apart. Part, yeah. Yeah, squat down with the hips lower than the shoulders and grasp the bar with a pronated grip. If stronger grip is needed, use hook grip. So remember that it's uh, for Olympic lifting, they accept pronated grip or hook grip. Um, and then, yep, you got your phases. So you got your first pull, you got your transition, then your second pull, and then your catch. Make sure you kind of know the difference in all, uh, in all the phases. All right. All right, so now just going into some of the notes. So yeah, the first one I just said, make sure you scroll to the end of the chapter for all the pictures and description. Really get those down pat. Um, and yeah, just remember the rules. Remember NSCA rules like for spotters because it might be different from what you learn. Uh, the one I always remember in particular is just a spot spotting a lunge. Like I had never, I had never uh, actually witnessed someone spotting a, a lunge while stepping with the person until I took this exam and saw that video. So again, that is actually correct form, ironically, with them. But again, I would I would have said that was wrong. So make sure you know their spotting rules. Uh, other notes, um, just knowing knowing the difference between grips, um, you know, pronated versus supinated versus hook versus uh, you know, open and false grip. Um, almost for everything, they're gonna want to close grip with the thumb around bar. They're gonna rarely say that anything's okay to have an open grip. Uh, does everyone know the difference between uh, Clean, uh, clean grip and snatch grip. So, which one is going to be the more narrow grip, clean or snatch? Clean, clean, exactly. So, clean is going to be uh, is going to be slightly wider than shoulder width outside of the knees. I kind of think of really similar to where you would be for a deadlift, maybe slightly more in. Uh, snatch grip is going to be much wider. Uh, do you all know the techniques that you can determine for somebody's snatch grip if they don't know it already? We have two that our NSCA accepts. It's going to be fist to opposite shoulder and then elbow to elbow. So fist to, fist to opposite shoulder would be you standing behind. I think we have a picture on the guy too, but um, it will be you having them with their arms out and you measure from their fist to the opposite shoulder, so you'd be behind it with a measuring tape, and that length would be it. Or you could do both arms out and go elbow to elbow. That's also called sca uh, scarecrow method. So again, fist to opposite shoulder or elbow to elbow are the two ways to discover somebody's snatch grip. Um, make sure you know your five body five point body contact position. That's mainly for like uh, bench exercises. It's gonna be your head and then your shoulders, and upper back, uh, glutes, then left foot, right foot. Um, Again, making sure you know the Val Valsalva maneuver. Uh, when when can the Valsalva maneuver be employed? Uh, at what point will we want to uh, incorporate that into an exercise? Lifting a lot of weight. Yep, heavy loads, bracing. So uh, yeah. yeah, you would need to be. Uh, shouldn't be doing it for loads less than eighty-five percent. It's more of a strength mechanism. Um, 
and yeah, pro, and obviously somebody needs to be proficient and understand uh, understand that because it does involve holding your breath. Um, for spotters, again, it's a, a chart on page three fifty six. That's good for explaining. It. Uh, but uh, remember, you don't need it for power. Uh, so yeah, you don't don't need to spot the claim. You want to, you want them to fail safely just by uh, getting the bar out of the way for power exercises. Um, for spotting someone when the bar is uh, on the front or back of shoulders, the person spotting uh, needs to be at least as tall or as strong as the lifter. So remember that for uh, spotting uh, like like a back squat or back lunge on the bar. Uh, what kind of grip do we want to have the spotter uh, for any exercises overhead? What grip would the spotter want? We want closed, supinated, alternated. For the spotter, what do we think for any exercise overhead? So like a bench press, for example. What grip would the spotter want? Alternated. Yep, alternated. And why is that? Any guesses? Because it's heavier, so it gives you better grip. I don't know. Just yeah. <laughs> so, uh, uh, exactly. Basically. So I mean, uh, I'm sure all of us have deadlifted. Have you have, have you all tried pro uh, deadlifting with a pronated versus alternated grip? Which one is easier for your grip? Alternated, right? Now, again, it's because you, you're leveraging for both sides, so you, you have two different grips, so it makes it easier. Uh, but also, just remember other reasons too. Um, for a pronated grip with bench press, what's the worst that could happen? Pronated grip, the bar slips. You don't want that happening right on their face or neck. And then supinated grip, again, going back to your point, makes you about heavy loads. We probably aren't able to bicep curl certain loads when we're getting real, real heavy, which would be what a supinated grip would require. Uh, so alternate is going to be the safest. For dumbbell stuff, you want to spot as close to the dumbbells as possible, or you can even spot the dumbbell itself. Um, and uh, remember, they're gonna uh, they, remember they want you following wrist on dumbbell exercises. So uh, I've seen some tests where they allow elbows and wrist, but um, NSCA wants you uh, staying on the wrist the entire time. Um, and then remember, if the load exceeds the spotter's ability to protect athletes, you can always get an extra spotter as well. Uh, for body weight exercises, these are going to be mainly closed chain compound movements that develop relative strength. Um, everybody knows the difference between open and closed chain exercises, right? Cool, cool. So, yep, uh, most of them bo body weight are going to be closed. Um, remember, also remember ground based free weight exercises are going to be preferable uh, to isolated exercises if you're trying to strengthen core. Um, another important note from this chapter they talk about is uh, remembering that. Uh, Again, if you if you follow if you follow Chris, you already uh, know what he thinks about the Bosu ball. But just kind of following uh, this point, uh, unstable surfaces do not strengthen core stability more than ground based free weights. Uh, I, I remember even years ago taking my test, they asked me that. Um, so that's that's an important one just to remember for the test. But also when people are doing you know core exercise, you know the I think the most common when you see somebody might be doing a heavy squat on like a Bosu ball, thinking. It's strengthening their core. Now, while it's making it harder to do, it's not actually going to help you produce more force and more core strength than just a ground-based exercise would do. So remember in that. Um, make sure you all know uh, some of the variable uh, resistance training methods like chains or bands. They talk about that. Uh, did you get any questions on chains or bands, Eric? Uh, did you get any questions uh, regarding like lifting weights with chains or bands on your exam yeah, like accommodating resistance they talked a lot about that all right cool so yeah make sure you uh understand uh yeah barrier and resistance um as far as determining proper chain resistance is going to be uh it's a chart on page 414 let me see if i can get there real quick so yeah you can uh you can look you can look at this chart um Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, check that for like mass, length, and diameter. Going back to the study guide. Um, where'd I go? Yeah. So determining the proper chain resistance is going to be the sum and average absolute chain resistance at the top and the bottom of the movement. So sum and average absolute chain resistance at top and bottom of the movement. Um, that's for chains. Then uh, resistance bands, obviously, is going to depend on the stiffness of the band and the deformation, how much it's stretched. 
And remember for res uh, banded resistance exercises, it's gonna be high tension at the top of the movement, low at the, lower at the bottom. Um, talk about some non-traditional training to end chapters. Uh, I believe that was 16, but uh, still limited research for efficacy. So uh, again, when we're talking about non-traditional methods, they talk about like logs, tires, even kettlebells can be considered these. Uh, the important thing to remember is these things can all be useful, but at least as of now, uh, we're still, you know, at, as of now, there's still obviously studies being done, but none of them have proven that still have overall better strength and force production gains than just barbell and free weight exercises. So if you ever get a question about any of the alternative methods and if they're better for building strength or force, remember it's always going to be free weights as of now. Um, look at page 418 for common tire flip for, uh, flaws. Definitely uh, might have this. You want to, uh, Look out for like placing the feet too close, hips rising faster than the shoulders. That's one that's common even like for like a deadlift. So think of like the tires and logs is similar to like deadlift and cleaning movements. Um, proper load is gonna be harder to determine for log lifts. Um, farmer's carry can be very beneficial. Make sure the athlete is trained and strong through the core. Um, again, kettlebell training can be great for uh, general prep but traditional free, free weight exercises are still going to be uh, more effective for uh, max strength and power. Uh, you know, when, uh, I, I, I love my kettlebells to death, so I hate having to answer that question on the exam because I, lo I love building my strength with kettlebells, but uh, now the research is still going to show you that barbell and free weight training is going to be still uh, superior. Um, and then unilateral training is going to be great for bilateral asymmetries and bilateral deficits. So, um, for unilateral training, remember that um, yeah, it's so it's not going to produce greater overall uh, strength and force benefits than just bilateral training, but it's great for injuries. Uh, I, we talked about Megan's knee earlier. Obviously, she wasn't going to be able to do the same thing on, on her healthy leg as she was on her weaker leg. Unilateral stuff is going to be great for rehab, not only because you can do different weights for the different legs, but also because um, you know our body neurally um, it it doesn't really decipher uh, all. The, it doesn't decipher that one leg is is weaker than the other while doing certain type of training. So let's say you're doing a pistol squat with your healthy leg. Neurally, your body isn't saying, oh, only this leg can do it. You're actually getting neural benefits um, and building new networks throughout the body. So unilateral can be great for that. Um, and then it might, you might get a question about uh, this bilateral facilitation versus uh, bilateral deficits. So bilateral facilitation is gonna be an increase in voluntary action of the uh, agonist muscle group. So that's pretty, uh, bilateral facilitation would be that um, pretty much that um, you're generating more, so that you're generating more force with a two-legged exercise than one. So basically think of bilateral facilitation as